Welcome back. Now, what are we supposed to make of a work of art like this? Um, 1,550 chairs stacked between two city buildings by Dora Salcedo. So we're going to return to this work of art at the very end of this mini lecture, but just uh, keep this in mind, how you might interpret it what it might mean given the fact that the title is just purely descriptive. It's not um, uh, hinting at any sort of meaning as far as we can tell so far. So this is Introduction to Art, Chapter 5, called Meaning in Art, Sociocultural Contexts, Symbolism, and Iconography. So let me turn off my video here and we will get going. So the learning out outcomes for this chapter are you should be able to place works of art in historical, social, personal, political, or scientific contexts, define and distinguish between symbolism and iconography, which is not easy to do, identify changes in symbols and iconographic motifs over time and in different cultures, relate iconography to visual literacy, describe connections between symbolism, iconography and storytelling and recognize metaphorical meanings in art. So the socio-cultural contexts are historical, social, personal or creative, a narrative context, oh excuse me, personal or creative narrative context, that's all one, a political context and a scientific context. Now you will notice some overlap in this textbook in the different between the different chapters where it seems like they're talking about the authors are talking about the same thing but bear in mind they're trying to approach art from several different directions in order to determine a kind of uh, theory of art or function of art so if it seems like the overlaps are not well thought out they actually are it's just uh a matter of approach. It differs at different points in the textbook. So the first context is historical. This is from the Dutch golden age of the 17th century. Holland was a very wealthy country at this point with lots of trading around the world. And a painting like this was intended to celebrate, um, <laughs> you know, goodies, goodies, things that you could buy with all the money that you had. Uh, I also would like to point out the similarity to the Vanitas paintings we've seen in past weeks. And those are paintings that show uh, the kind of like the subtext is the folly of human um, endeavors in the end. So death will finally come. What's important is how you've, you know, say how you've treated other people how spiritual you've been. These paintings convey an idea of wealth, but also perhaps a kind of warning about decay. Now, next we have social context and notice that this artist is a woman, Lily Martin Spencer. This painting is entitled Conversation Piece and it shows her, her baby girl and her husband. And she actually supported the family uh, by painting. And there were, not there weren't a lot of women artists in the 19th century say but there were many more than art history actually recognizes recognizes and they're becoming more um known to us today so their importance definitely should not be underestimated but bear in mind the kind of difficulties they would have had in this sort of man's world of the art world at the time Excuse me, I skipped one. No, here we go. Personal or creative narrative context. This is Charles de Muth's The Figure Five in Gold. It's a line from a William Carlos Williams poem. De Muth and Williams were friends back in Philadelphia back in the day. And uh, this painting is intended as a portrait of Williams. And yet, as you can see, there is no image of a person in it, as far as I can tell. Uh, we do have, uh, at the very bottom, it looks like an MCM, but it's actually WCM, I believe, William Carlos Williams. So a kind of portrait of a friend based on the friend's writings. But you can see how a painting like this 
does not easily convey its meaning in a kind of narrative sense. I mean, it doesn't tell a clear story. The poem itself does, but the uh, it conveys an interesting sort of mood. Now, we have Cow Skull, Red, White, and Blue by Georgia O'Keeffe here. And if there's a 20th century artist who's incredibly well known, who painted from a very individualistic standpoint, I think you could say it's Georgia O'Keeffe. These paintings have a very, uh, not so much an idiosyncratic style, but she's not really trying to convey a specific meaning or tell a certain story. For instance, I don't think this is about inevitable death. I mean, maybe it is with the uh, cow skull, but there is something going on here. It's a kind of celebration probably of the landscape that she loved in New Mexico, that kind of thing. So it's a personal, you almost have to see something this as a sort of poem, as in the Demuth painting, where it's kind of like uh, a line from a poem that might not convey a larger story, or it might, or it might be the sort of thing that's very difficult to convey in words. So next we have a uh, the political context, and this is Goya's uh, kind of documentation of the horrors of the um, war between France and Spain when the French, when Napoleon invaded. So uh, this actually was not, these works weren't published until well after Goya's death, probably because they were a bit too graphic and in one sense ambiguous because he doesn't really take sides uh, except to say that civilians shouldn't be subject to slaughter in wartime but it's not that he, he's not specifically favoring one side or another in the war just in a war but but just showing the horrors of war so we have the scientific context this can be seen as art that starts from a scientific uh, kind of perspective, perhaps, or you know, or the artist was really interest, interested in um, scientific theories and processes. And for instance, Edward Muybridge's Horse in Motion, this predates motion pictures. Uh, I'm not sure the date on this, but 1878. I believe that says there. So long before motion picture film was invented, but you can see that Mybridge's experiments, part of this was to figure out whether a galloping horse had all four legs off the ground at the same time. Yes, indeed, it's true. And this settled the bet. But it probably also launched an entire uh, sort of industry of the cinema uh, of the cinema and also other things that have moving images like television and video games just think how this acts as a kind of precursor to what we think of as animation animated um, movies today now excuse me went too far symbolism and iconography this gets a little more difficult to make a distinction between these two but we're going to talk about, or the chapter talks about changes in meaning of symbols and iconography, how they change over time and in different cultures. Symbolism, iconography, and visual literacy, how we learn to read these images, basically. Symbolism and iconography in mythology and storytelling. And exploring symbolic and icono iconographic motifs. And then finally, metaphorical meanings, which will bring us back to 1550 chairs that we saw at the beginning. So think of an image, the swastika here. In Eastern cultures, it had no negative connotation. Matter of fact, it was positive. Then, of course, we all know that the Nazis adopted it and I think flipped it the other way. Now, these are running the same way. I, I, I thought... It looks like the Buddhist chest has the swastika facing one direction. The one on the right here, I think that might be a Native American design. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on that, sorry. But, but the Nazi swastika faces the other way from the Buddhist version. But so a symbol like this can be co-opted, uh, turned from one meaning, a kind of um, meaning of eternal 
uh, you know, kind of this wheel of life thing, which I believe it mo means in this Buddhist context, to a symbol of, uh, you know, tyrannical power. Now, this ritual vase from Warka, one of the issues here is even if you were in this partic particular culture, you might not necessarily know uh, what individual motifs, symbols, stories meant unless you were told. So sometimes you hear that in the medieval period, for instance, a lot of religious art was meant to tell stories. Bible stories say, and it certainly was, to a an illiterate population, but that still probably meant that you were hearing part of the story being told to you so that you could better understand it. It is a little difficult to tell a complex story completely with visuals, but without words. It's not impossible, and we see it in movies and graphic novels and the like, but it is somewhat difficult. So Symbolism, iconography, and visual literacy go together because you need to learn the meanings of these things, and then sometimes the meanings shift. Here's a sketch of a section from the Warka vase. And we have symbolism and iconic iconography. I'm having trouble saying that. In mythology and storytelling. Oh, and in case I forget, a real difference between symbolism and iconography, despite their similar similarities, you can say that symbolism falls under iconography. Symbolism is the meaning of certain signs and Im images to a particular culture. Iconography is the broader study of it, the broader study of images. So it's like a kind of... Um, catch-all holding basin for everything that everything visual that falls into it symbolism in that sense is more specific now in a painting like this we have uh the annunciation from the new testament uh, but but you know, we have various symbols like the candle flame being snuffed out in the middle. The, uh, I'm trying to, um, this image is a little small for me to see. There could be a dove, a bird um, floating in the background. There are all sorts of images and um, symbols, but they don't necessarily have the same meaning over time. Again, you would have to know particular aspects of this story in order to understand what's going on. Oops, and I wanted to back up. I also wanted to mention uh, that our textbook mentions the winged winged creatures are prevalent in a number of different cultures. So in this Judeo-Christian and Islamic context too, I'd say these winged creatures, angels and the like, um, they represent you know, uh, sort of beings who are closer to God than humans are, but in different cultures, it can mean different things. So back to Salcedo's 1550 chairs, we can talk about metaphorical meanings. This uh, is actually a kind of representation of an uprising that occurred in Colombia, her um, native country, back in 1985, and a lot of people were displaced, had to leave their homes, and as I understand, there were quite a few deaths. So the chairs represent this kind of upheaval, upheaval in life. I mean, maybe they stand for individual people, maybe they stand for places that were destroyed, but you can see... The meaning really depends on knowing certain aspects of the story, but visually in person, I mean, it must have been a, quite an experience to stand in front of this wall of chairs between two buildings and feel that sort of oppressive weight. So which socio sociocultural context corresponds, corresponds best with your chosen artwork and why? Again, we have historical social, personal, or creative narrative context, political context, and scientific context. And if there's some overlap, do not be alarmed. You're bound to find more than one, although you can discuss just one if you wish. And that is the end of this slideshow. I will see you in the next chapter. Thanks again for joining me.